Welcome to our mini broadcast for Sunday, the 11th of October. And I'm going to start by reading the Gospel from Matthew 22. Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to call those who had been invited to the wedding, but they would not come. Again he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who have been invited, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it, and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, maltreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Mm -hmm. Then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Mm -hmm. Go therefore into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. The servants went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot, and throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. It's quite a startling and striking parable, but one I think that has significant message for us today. Many people who are not Christian think that the Christian life is dull and boring. But Jesus described the Christian life rather more like a party, and a royal party at that. Bertrand Russell talked of the future in terms of the firm foundations of unyielding despair. But Jesus spoke of the kingdom of heaven, as a party, a celebration. I wonder if you and I have that perspective, and if our lives suggest to others that that is what we believe. Wedding banquets in those days would have been carefully planned, no less than wedding receptions in our day, but they would have lasted quite a bit longer. Prospective guests would be invited in advance and then notified when the feast was ready. In this case, it's a lavish mid-morning wedding breakfast that's being described. You would expect the guest to say something like, thank you very much, we will come to the palace straight away. But instead, they all refuse to come. It's extraordinary, offensive, rude. The king doesn't give up. He asks again. He sends more servants. He gives details. But these servants are, first of all, ignored and disregarded. They're maltreated, and, and it gets worse, far worse. They're seized, assaulted, killed. The attitude that the invited guests have to the king is completely shocking. It's rather as if one of us had received an invitation from Buckingham Palace for a royal wedding. But not only do we tear up the embossed card, we also murder the postman. And little wonder then the king responds as he does, sending in the army. But what is amazingly wonderful is that the party is not cancelled. 
the celebrations go on and the wedding banquet is thrown open to everyone. Go out into the street, the servants are told, and invite everyone you see. And they bring in all they could find. And the banqueting hall is full of people, both bad and good. No one then at that party is there because of their own worthiness. The privilege of being at the banquet is down to the grace of the king alone. But when he comes in to meet the guests, he finds a man who's not wearing the proper clothes for the wedding. Where is your wedding garment? he says. And then that dreadful sentence is pronounced as he is bound hand and foot and thrown into outer darkness. But what are we to make of this? Of the person who's clearly out of place and gets thrown out? Well, it's quite helpful to know that at that kind of wedding, the guests would often be clothed with robes provided by the host. And presumably, everyone else there was properly clothed, was wearing the wedding robes that were the gift from the king. It makes me think of a passage in Revelation chapter 7, which speaks of multitudes in heaven from every tribe and tongue and nation who've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. In that passage, the robes speak of those people's right to be there in heaven, not a right that was their own, not one they had earned or inherited, but one that had been purchased for them and given to them as a gift by the Lord Jesus. For those who first heard Jesus tell the parable would have probably found it infuriating and shocking. The uh, religious leaders would doubtless have seen themselves being criticised. But we have to remember the context, that Jesus was about to be put to death on the cross, that Holy Week was just around the corner. Familiarity can lead us to be too comfortable about the events of Jesus' death. But the fact that it had to happen and that we benefit from it should not detract from its absolute horror. Two chapters back in Matthew 20, Jesus said, The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Many are invited. The scope of God's love is worldwide, but few are chosen because not everyone wants to be there. We are invited as Christians to be party goers, bowled over to find ourselves welcomed by the King because of his Son, and delighting in his love because eternal life starts in the here and now. We're also to be the messengers of the King, letting absolutely everyone know about the love that God has for them. Telling them about Jesus, serving them and showing them his love, whatever they appear to be like to us. All the people of our community are welcome to the party, the bad and the good, and we are sent out to invite them in. Think what might happen if we saw ourselves in Headley, in Box Hill, in Walton on the Hill, as those who are carrying wedding invitations from the King of Kings. I want to close with a prayer that's a harvest prayer. And I thought it would be quiet to see some of the decorations in front of me and behind me that we had uh, for harvest last Sunday.
eternal God, who crownest the year with thy goodness, and dost give us the fruit of the earth in their season. Give us grace that we may use them to thy glory, for the relief of those in need, and for our own well-being. Through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I'm going to play a song now that both celebrates this harvest from last Sunday, but also gives thanks uh, to God who invites us to share in his a celebration. From all that dwells below the skies, let the Creator's praise arise. Let the Redeemer's name be sung through every land, by every tongue. Hallelujah. with his love and inspire you to spread the good news of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. <laughs>